Welcome on behalf of Prom Peru, the National Society of Mining, Oil and Energy collaborated with us to prepare this round of presentations on services to the mining industry. Now we welcome Mr. Luis Felipe Gil. He is the Supplier Innovation and Technology Manager of the National Society of Mining, Oil and Energy of Peru. He's going to give his welcoming words to the supplier sector of Peru's mining industry. Hi, my name is Luis Felipe Gil, and I'm the manager of the provider sector of the National Society of Mining, Oil, and Energy of Peru. Our sector is the oldest of Peru and was founded in 1826 and is the house of over 40 of the most important companies of extraction in Peru, which includes the mining sector, energy, and oil. But in this opportunity, I would like to take a few minutes to speak about the huge importance that the provider sector of assets and services has in the energetic and mining sector of the country. And even more in the last year, how important it has been and fundamental too for the modernization of our sector to the adaptation and adoption of new technologies, safer, more remote, and more automatized. If we grab an example of the mining sector, the Central Bank of Reserves of Peru estimates that around 30% of the added value of all the mining sector depends strictly on the services and assets provide provision. This represents over $400,000 million only in 2019, a figure that's rather attractive. But beyond that, the impact that operators have as a source of employment is really important for the country. We calculate that for every job position that is generated directly from mining, another aid are generated in providers of assets and services. So it's important to highlight that these positions are formal positions in a payment chain that's insured and of projects in the long term. As you all know, 2020 has been a really difficult year, not just for the mining and energetic sector, but overall for the entire city and entire country and the world because of the pandemic of COVID 2019. Now we are still fighting this in the energy sector. We think that this has been a really important opportunity, that push that we needed for a modernization of the sector itself and accelerate the transformation of digital processes in our operations. For over 10 years, the National Society of Mining, Oil and Energy has been working together with their associates in different strategies to be able to encourage the industry to adapt the best practices worldwide. And through the Innovation and Technology Committee that's put together by the directors of innovation of over 140 associates that we have, we organized at the Teddy Guy Symposium that we all know as TCAR of the mining and energetic sector. That's the most important one in the country where the companies, providers and academics We get together to establish operations, solutions, and anything that we can talk about of the extractive industry. A couple of years ago, we launched the first hackathon at the energetic level worldwide, where we have acknowledged 15 projects, and now they've become startups, and they are working as suppliers and providers in our industry. Additionally to this, we acknowledge the effort of the companies in Peru to modernize, and annually, we award the energetic award that in 2021, had his eighth edition. And finally, we acknowledge that only through a mutual collaboration ecosystem among all of the actors of the industry, it will be able to accelerate transformation of our sector and promote development. That's why that in this effort of co-creating collective knowledge of innovation in an innovative system such as Peruvian one, the society and their committee of innovation and innovation with the Mindergy Connect platform, we'll build a platform where all of the actors and stakeholders can share the information and help to the solution of problems that are of common ground in a fast manner. We invite you to check our social media where you are going to be able to find information about all the people and companies that are working in this and also get in contact and touch with them. Peru has a lot of opportunities of investment in the mining and energetic sector is one of the most solid ones to work with. We invite you all to unite us and contact us to our social networks. We are pretty sure that we will have the conditions that you all need to create investment here. Thank you very much. Now, we receive Mr. Edward Alarcon, the president of the IT Committee of Minergy. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Diego Alcon by Paikang. I am part of the Mining Petroleum and Energy National Society, and we're going to have a presentation about what do we do in regards of our community and what do we provide to everyone in the energetic environment of the country. The Committee of Technology and Innovation is a community that works and has been working for over 10 years in a collaborative environment. That's why it's our interest to share experiences, get to know new technologies, and to solve common problems that we are all affected by. The mining community, it's a really collaborative community, given that we don't, we're not in competition as such. We all collaborate together in an environment. We are professionals and responsibles of different areas of technology, innovation, and this comes from all of the companies associated to the Association of Mining. And we put together a lot of experience and dynamism in the sector. We've created several spaces for this type of cooperation, and we want to have this positive relation with providers, suppliers, the academics, and uh, all the agencies that are being incorporated to this e ecosystem that we are working on right now. What are the pillars, though, of our committee? We have the TICAR, which is our um, most powerful event. Last year, we've conducted our 11th edition of this event, and the purpose is to exchange ideas and to get to know new te technology trends and to also know about the opportunities that we have to innovate in the sector. We have our award to technological innovation, which is the first award that exists of this nature. The objective is to encourage and highlight and get to know the innovation efforts that we have going on in the sector in from the academia, professionals, and uh, startups. We have our hackathon, which is an open innovative space. We have different editions and different uh, hackathon editions that basically what they do is to present challenges that all of our companies in the sector go through and have to face. We want people from universities and uh, people that are startups, entrepreneurs that will and want to participate. We have finally our MyEnergy Connect platform. It's a virtual community, which is a collaborative space that we've created. So all of the uh, stakeholders can connect and exchange information. It's an open space to articulate and facilitate encounters, contacts. We enable transfer of knowledge throughout the nation. So these are our four pillars. What are the results that we've obtained throughout these years? In the car, like I've mentioned, we've had 11 of these shows, over 3,500 people participating that are related to the sector, over 270 speakers in national, local speakers and foreign speakers, and over 100 in of supplier companies that also participated. Obviously, last year we had this TCAR virtually. It, it was still a success. Then talking about our Technological Innovation Award, last year we had our eighth edition, over 280 presented projects with the participation of 30 universities across the country. And with a concrete result, we now have three created startups that are now suppliers of the sector. We want to exist or we want to have more startups like this to exist in the environment and in our field with the support of universities so we can also undergo a mentoring process into this uh, future. In regards to the hackathon, we've had six editions, over 1,200 participants. And again, we've shared ideas, uh, innovative ideas have been shared through the suppliers. In the future, 
How is it that we see the extractive industry in the world? How is mining going to be in Peru? This year that just passed, we've had enormous challenges. One of the biggest challenge was the COVID problem. We had to uh, reshape our areas and that were aligned to companies and we wanted to ensure the secure mobilization of our workers to their homes and to their operations, safe commuting. In Peru, we have a pretty particular scenario where mining operations and oil operations are in far away areas in really harsh conditions. In mining, we're talking about operations over 5,000 meters above sea level. In oil, we're talking about jungle areas where uh, accessing to these uh, very same areas, it's rather difficult. So that's why this challenge has been rather big for us. We had to start working remotely. And for that, we had to ensure the availability of the services and also to keep operations at 100% with the least amount of staff possible. The challenges not are only coming to the efficiency side, but it's also coming to biosafety. Another challenge that's also big for us and that we had to face last year and we are still facing is the protection of our cybernetic systems to prevent those cybernetic attacks. There's been an important increase of uh, cyber attacks to networks, to management of networks, to industrial networks. That's why we are really focused in cybersecurity. All of the initiatives of automation and digitization that have been prioritized in the previous year due to the pandemics, well, it's been really positive for us, but it comes associated to a whole range of uh, security concerns that we should not overlook. And just as a pretty big challenge, we need to still keep all of the biosafety systems enabled and in, uh, incorporated. We need to, and we understand that this reality is going to stay, the pandemic itself, and I hope that everything is over soon, but this scenario has changed substantially. So we know that the biosafety issues and remote work and all of this that I'm talking about, it's going to remain for a while. So the question is if the companies of this sector is prepared or are prepared for this scenario, nobody had this mapped out. And if it's true, a lot of the companies of the sector has continuity plans for their business. And as a matter of fact, they have a stocks in the market and they have a higher level of compliance, but none of them had a pandemic scenario figured out. I think that it's safe to say that pretty much all the companies were able to develop an excellent piece of work. Some of the companies were more prepared than others to solve this type of problems. And, uh, but actually the uh, support of the technology area itself and information has been greater. The scope of action has grown substantially. And now we have a lot more processes in the value chain that are supported by technology. If we were focused more in the operations side before and the financial accountability and maintenance side of it all, now we are also supporting areas that we went focusing as much in relation to technology, like for example, environment or health itself. So we do have a greater interaction now with a lot more areas, the technology areas, innovation, where those in charge of um, adjusting operationally all of these changes to have a better monitoring and support to this monitoring. I think that this year, all of the technology areas and they have had an overwhelming development and performance uh, to ensure that operations work in an environment that we were not prepared to in the first hand. Now, the pandemic has been a really nice opportunity to accelerate transformation. And we've had many experiences. We've had also failures 
Uh, but I think that we have a value of community in just here because we're really collaborative and we share success and failures. And that allows for the sector itself to move forward and in big leaps, the matter of supporting and being supported and have a technical collaborative community is also a really positive point for suppliers. They know that we exchange a lot of information and a successful project is going to basically be of everyone's knowledge. So it sort of applies a positive uh, pressure to all of us. In the mining society, we have over 40 companies that are united and the most important of the, com of the country. In regards of digital transformation, Peru has a lot of path to take and to walk. We are in the 98th position of 141 the economies that are adopting technology. And I think that mining introduces a big opportunity to move forward, a lot to develop, a lot to walk. And if we make an analogy of this, of almost this 15 years that I have in the mining sector, uh, and previously I have an experience in the service market in banking and so on, but the advance in mining has been huge in technology adoption. You cannot even imagine having, for example, a banking company or a telecom company without an excessive or extensive use of technology. And before that, we thought that mining was using only a little bit of technology, but we actually use a lot more technology than that and a lot more in the future. And this technology is associated to many different uh, specialties. So we have a huge opportunity of development and we understand that we'll have more immersive technology in the processes of the value chain in mining from the exploration scope till the commercialization of goods. So beyond the term digital transformation itself, I think that this is a digital opportunity for all of the companies in the sector. One of the pillars is the collective knowledge to have a collaborative network. And MyEnergy Connect has companies, suppliers, universities, academia. We have many of these people involved, the entrepreneurs. We have people that have a, a, are leaders or are considered to be leaders of opinion. We have a platform for them to interact with us also, and we are the ones sending them our challenges and we send them our issues that are quite different and random in social, environmental, and even productive and cost related. Because mining, it's an activity that pulls a product out to the market but it doesn't have a product that's fixed by us. It's a price that's fixed by the worldwide market. We do not control that. And whatever we can control our costs, we need to be more efficient. So we have challenges all of our ways coming to us. We need suppliers, we need power for suppliers for that. Things that work will do if everything is rather integrated and all of these types of gears work perfectly towards a common objective. We need suppliers that provides us technological solutions that can fit the reality of Peru, meaning we need universities that it can train professionals associated to the demand and to the supply and demand, of course, we generate a demand to the companies. And people that start their own business, entrepreneurs that just jump to it to create technology to solve our problems. And the leaders of opinion, the decision makers that need to be aligned for all of this to have a good set of wheels and move to the future. We all need to work collaboratively. And well, that's Mindergy Connect is a mining energetic community which has a goal of sharing and build collaborative knowledge. This is within the mining society, which is the institution that groups the most important mining companies 
and at the same time it's an ideal platform to get to know each other and collaborate among all of us we have a website also which we invite you to enroll and check register publish content get to know all of the events that we're going to be conducting and have a connection with the key stakeholders and the decision makers technology wise that are going to be good for everyone we have news events upcoming trends reports specialists type of columns and we want you to participate there too please be a part of our community my energy connect thank you very much now mr edward alarcon will speak as it corporate manager of hochschild mining good morning my name is edward alarcon i'm the manager of information and technology and let me introduce you to what's hochschild mining we are a company that has over Uh, that has over 100 years of existence. We are leading the underground precious metals of high grade silver and gold. We've been operating in the Americas for over 50 years as well. In 2019, we had a production of 38 million ounces of silver equivalent, and we have over 4,500 direct workers specialized in underground mining. And the purpose of our company is there in our slide responsible and innovative mining, committed to a better world and for a better world. We currently operate in three underground mines, two that are located in the south of Peru and in one in southern Argentina. All of our underground operations are epithermal, uh, meaning we still uh, in the operations of silver and gold concentrate or, or door, as we call, All of our operations produce these uh, concentrate, like a set of gold, or we have some uh, weldings and some of this. In 2019, we've acquired 100% of an important project in Chile called Biolantanidos, which is uh, one of the few important projects in this odd lands in this part of the world. We see now a map of the uh, Hochschild operations in the mining cluster that we have in Peru. We see all of the mines, the projects, and the properties themselves that are of the ground. Clearly, this is an area of great potential. We have been operating in this area for many years now. And like I said previously, it, we have always been specializing in these precious metals. What are we doing now? And what is the present of Hochschild? Well, this pandemic situation has made us, obliged us to react rather quickly. We have all of our workers working remotely for a year now almost. And that has been a challenge, to say the least, for the technology team and for the whole company overall. We are currently operating remotely, meaning on the administrative operators and uh, Well, we have 100% work in our plans. We have biosecurity IT systems developed to track employees. We have a really important management of data. We have strict protocols for COVID-19. And it allows us for our operations to currently be at 100%, like I said. This year has been really important for projects of automation and digitization. We've been developing tele telemetry projects inside of the mine and to control the drills and trucking and, and the IoT use, for example, as that has been intensified, especially for safety and security controls. We have fatigue control system, we have productivity control systems, we have environmental control systems. So the use of IoT is going to gain more ground. And the same thing will happen with the main systems because we have SAP, which is our most important system, managemental and finance, financial system that is running in HANA Enterprise Cloud. We're in the, in the cloud and we are working with the last SAP for HANA version. In cybersecurity, we've also been really um, interested into the cybersecurity because we have all of its automation projects and digitization projects that are attached to 
security standards. We are working with um, ISO 27001 uh, since 2008. We also believe that we've developed several projects especially linked to security itself, safety and environment. In this year, 2021, we are implementing an ore sorting plant as a pilot in the Inmaculada area. This is going to allow us to have a plant that's more efficient and uh, sustainability, it, which is a really important subject for us, the relationship with communities, which is really being supported by connectivity and technology. We're connecting with several communities that are nearby our operations in the mine, and we are all providing free internet with a huge impact on education, health, and the financial system. We're also looking to work with local companies that are surrounding these mining areas. The connectivity program or project is an award project that's been uh, gathering a lot of experience since 2012. We've been developing projects of digitization for communities and an environment we have a really important goal of carbon emissions. We have a project that's been also awarded at a, an international lover level that's called EcoScore, which is a, some sort of metric to measure the impact that we have for our environmental indicators. Now, what are the next steps for us? We are in a road to a digital mine. We have several types of technologies and trends that are currently are ongoing in the world in gamification, blockchain, IoT, virtual reality, sensors, 5G, beacons. So technology that approaches the mining world every time more and more. So that's why we are focused into bringing these technologies into the mining practice. And we have a digital agenda as well. It is 2021 towards the 2023. We want to use a lot more artificial intelligence in many processes and using data to make analytics that would allow us to predict and react really quickly and making decisions that allow us to be more efficient and productive and safer. Also, we'll be taking over this technology innovative uh, processes will basically work with ELTE and why not 5G? So the use of drones inside of the mine is also a matter that we are going to be analyzing in these upcoming years. And the digital twin that is going to allow us to simulate or have a drill of different processes to become more optimal and everything that have to do with the plant. Edge computing also to have faster responses and to take action in case we have any sort of event inside of the operation, we have our edge computing system. So what's the future for us? How do we envision this future in hot We have to be, we have to be working in a digitized type of mind to use artificial intelligence in exploration. We have experience in this type of matter. And I believe that these upcoming years we'll see some of those results. I believe that robots for narrow veins, because we have some minds that have that type of topology and we are working on this type of research and we want to put a lot of emphasis into it. The augmented reality used for training is also something that is a reality that uh, is coming our way faster than we think. And the use of artificial intelligence to predict this behavior, especially in uh, industrial security matters, also, we work with exoskeletons, and we are assessing this already. We are assessing different prototypes, and we are looking for the utility and applicability of this, of this type of new technologies. We also believe that water management is really important for us, and we are not estranged from it. The use of blockchain for different types of processes and matters in commercial processes, legal, logistical, compliance, and social responsibility. That's something that we believe is the future for the minds that we are operating. Finally, the human team, the human group of Hochschild 
is rather capable and innovative. Is always looking after the efficiencies, just as we've heard in previous minds, all of the new trends and technologies that exist in the market, we try to innovate them and land them into reality that we are in our own underground operations that we're working with. We are working for over 50 years in the Americas and this is our 100 year old company. Like our, we hear all the time, our purpose is to work for a better world. Thank you very much. Now we pass the floor to Mrs. Silvia Dioses. She is the business management director of ISA Rep. Good afternoon. My name is Silva Dioses. I'm the director of the management system of companies in ISA Rep. We are a company that transports energy. And today I'm here to let you know about our sector, of our electric sector, what challenges we have, how do we see the future, and to let you know how is it that ESA Rep is facing and contributing to the future and to the development of the country. First off, let me explain to you about the electric sector. Improve our sector works like this. We generate, transmit, and distribute. Generation are basically the electric centrals that produce electricity that we use and we consume using different sources, energy, natural gas, water, sun, wind. We have 66 generators in Peru. We have transmission then. Then this electricity that's generated in the central has to go, has to be transported to the electric grid system that's interconnected nationally to enter cities. That's what we call transmission. And we have 21 transmitters. And finally, from the transmission, we carry it out into distribution, which is who basically delivers energy from the entry points of cities to homes and industry. We have 23 distributors, 23. So that network belongs to the transmission network as well. And this is the system that we live nowadays. And we've been living it quite a while already, but evidently our future comes in not so further. We are a part of the world and we have worldwide and the electric sector has challenges because we have worldwide trends that are impacting us. We have technological advancements, climate change, scarcity of resources. We have demographic changes, the transfer of financial power, acceleration of urbanization. Let me tell you, all of this in the world are the challenges of the 5D, meaning we need to go towards a sector that's decarbonized, digitalized, distributed, deregulated, and with a disruption that's total for the demand. The electric sector in Peru cannot be left behind, and that's why we have a vision for the future towards where we're going. And what we've declared, our statement across the sector and coordinated with the Energy and Mines Ministries to increase the power and the entry of new technology to empower users with new services to ensure safety, security of the supply and the modernization of the sector. So we have huge challenges because we are a sector that, for example, in this 2020, with everything that we went through, has not stopped, not even a day. All of the room was basically delayed, but we moved forward because energy power was there. But internally, we see these challenges. We acknowledge them, and we're not going to solve them by ourselves. We need to work with ecosystems. But let me tell you about how ESA Rep contributes to all of these challenges and into solving them and achieving them. Before that, let me tell you that we are part of a company group that's called ESA. ESA is a multi Latin that has 53 years already of existence. We are in six countries in Central America. We have three types of businesses. One of them has to do with energy and power transportation. The other one has to do with optic fiber. And we also have to, and we work with pathways, highways. We are big and we have over, we have over 44,000 employees and many of them are women. 
30 of our directors are women. We are in different countries across the sectors with different businesses, and we go in Peru through ESA that transports energy, but we also have a company of projects of infrastructure that help us to build Internexa and ATP, which is of telecom. We will talk about Isarep. Isarep, it's been 19 years already transmitting connections that inspire. We were born of a concession that the Peruvian government gave. We are part of the concession of the Peruvian state. We have a purpose. We know that businesses change. We know that societies require companies that are committed, capable of leaving landmarks, legacy to people. And this philosophy inspires us to enact, to relate to the world and generate connections that inspire. This is our purpose, to generate connections that inspire. And all of that based on these pillars that we call life, green innovation, development and articulation. In a growth art framework, we have an only strategy and our strategy is to grow with sustainable value. For us, sustainable value means that we generate income for the stakeholder, that we generate in, in, impact, societal impact, and a corporate sale. That's how we see that we're going to face these challenges that we identify in the industry. And none of this is possible because we have a human team that's incredible. This is our group, face-to-face -to -face and virtually, we've been there. Last year, we were happily awarded as a great place to work, as one of the best companies to work during 2020. And thanks to this talent is that we are who we are. We manage three companies, Repset, TM, and Isa Peru. We build, operate, and keep lines, 79 substations that are built and in construction. We offer services of transmission to the government, but also to the generating companies and big users. We have over 12,000 kilometers of lines, 73% of share in the market, over 21 departments with 400 workers, and we have these good results with a EBITDA consolidated of $324 million in our commitment with life. We were new carbon neutral in 2019 with 3,227 tons of CO2 that have been compensated for. We bet on the growth for the country and right now, we have an investment potential of $2 billion, and we've advanced with the pandemics. And last year, just finishing the year, we were able to win an award of a project for Chicanasta. It's really necessary a project that we are building right now 900 kilometers of line in, in Nueva Mantaro, Carapongo, Nueva Yanango, all of these areas are the center highland of Peru as that block. And we are signing agreements to make projects in Nazca, Chincha, Chilca, in the Lima area. And also I was forgetting, we were building the connection with Petro Peru and the connection with the Yabeco, that mining the company is really important in the South and we are providing energy over there. Not only that, but we're also betting on a lot more growth than that being an important stakeholder to enforce the transmission system in Lima, Peruvian energy that cannot have any barriers to interconnect with countries such as Ecuador, Chile, Bolivia, Brazil. How can we uh, broaden the capacity of our lines? That future is what we know. But what happens with that future in the future when we talk about technology? We have a 2030 vision of what the sector is. We are not only in transmission, we are broadening our horizons. We offer transportation of energy that's trustworthy, safe, modern, efficient, flexible as well. The response to the five Ds, decarbonization, digitization, decentralization, and it, it challenges to uh, disrupt 
that the men. We are also working strongly into the capacity building, capacity of our people, because the capacities and skills that we have nowadays are not those that are going to be joining us in the capacities and skills of 2030. And within all of that, I would like to highlight what digital transformation is. For us, it's a skill, a capability, and it's a way that we want to take advantage of possibilities to manage risk of the whole surrounding that we live. Let me tell you, we have five agendas of value and the digital transformation we guided towards the impact in the business to be more productive, to improve services towards the clients, to have real digital talent that is a, a reference and to manage cybersecurity. We always in, envision the ESA reps so digital and the domains that we've chosen are analytics, in the, in the artificial intelligence, digital twins, and all of the solutions of transportation and mobility for operation and maintenance. Let me tell you also that another capability that we have is of innovation. Our innovation response to the current business to the adjacent business, but also we look new business models. How can we disrupt the market? Well, we and I am sharing right now is some of the projects that we've conducted. And the important thing is that the innovation that we go through, it's not only technical, not only in maintenance, we also innovate for clients or we innovate looking after sustainability, looking for ways to complement the economy of the communities that we have a relationship with. We're really happy of being able to create a, a, co a corporate initiative of two open challenges of innovation. We've been able to have funds alongside the state of $100,000 and people respond really well to it. We have an innovation culture that's really strong in numbers can reflect that. And also, let me tell you that that's only a side of it, but for us, the articulation of sustainability being good, being well, is not only within us and for us. We all have to be good and we all have to contribute towards that development. And that's where we have a lot of dreams with Peru. That's why our guide and our focus is to education, local development, social infrastructure, and action towards climate. That's what we work with from Peru. And that's what I was talking to you about with the 5Ds. In that democratization, people um, participate more in this decarbonization. I need to have delivered action and specific actions uh, to enable the process of this. We have a program that's called Jaguar Connection because we believe that if we give life to the Jaguar's ecosystem around it, there's a lot more life. There's trees, water, many other animals, and that's perfect for life to develop and there's prosperity around it. There's only two problems, uh, but well, we've faced and we've established two programs in 2018 in San Martín and Ucayali, only 256,000 hectares preserved by Jaguar Connection. These projects are thought through to be 10 years. We have 4 million and 100,000 of the countries surrounding and 2 million that uh, Peru has reduced in CO2. So the electric sector, the power sector is also betting on the well-being of the country. We are a solid group. We have a commitment with the country. We're sustainable, innovative, transparent, and we believe that our relationship with Peru, even though we are a concession with just a, a, a contract, it's of long term. Thank you very much. Now we pass the floor to Mr. Alessandri Zapata, who is the head of digital transformation of GMP. And he will present with Mrs. Dedi Calderon, who is the head of business development of GMP. Hello, how are you doing? My name is Dedi Calderon. I'm the chief of development of businesses of GMP. Before anything, I would like to thank you Peru for this invite to this event. We are a Peruvian company that was founded in 1984, and that's why we have over 35 years providing services to the oil and gas industry in the country. We do exploration and development gas in lot one, four, and five, and these lots are located in the northeast of Peru. We own and we operate a processing plant of natural gas in Parinas. Of this plant, we obtain natural gas dry and we commercialize liquid gas like GLP and condensated. 
our strategy of growth is basically in investing in infrastructure businesses in energy, not just oil and gas, in the national level and international. That can allow us to receive stable flows at a long term, and that would allow us to take advantage of the synergies be inside of the companies that are part of the corporation. Within the value chain of the oil and gas industry, where are we? GMP is in the chain of exploration and production, as I mentioned it at the beginning. We are in the sector of gas processing, and we are also in the sector of reception and the uh, of gas. Also, regarding our exploration unit, we GMP produce 9% of the oil that is produced at the national level. And as I mentioned, we have four lots, lot one and lot five, have a contract of services with the Peruvian state and government and lot three and four have a license contract. The production of raw that we have goes up to 40,000 barrels per day and the production of gas of our lots is up to 10 million cubic meters. I want to highlight that in this 2021, we'll start the campaign of drilling of lot three and four with which we are waiting for to increase our production in raw and in natural gas. Regarding our units of gas plant, our plant is set at seven kilometers from the Talada city. The capacity of this plant is to process 44 million cubic feet per day, where we process gas from lots of DMP and a lot of many other producers of the area. This plant processes natural gas associated, and we obtain dry natural gases when it can be commercialized up north in an electric client, all to the refinery of Talara and all of other clients. We also commercialize liquids like GLP and condensated. I would like to highlight here that we are also assessing and developing projects of natural gas that's compressed and liquid by natural gas. Regarding our units of business for transportation and distribution with our partner, Oil Tanking, which is a German company leader in this type of operations worldwide, we created Terminals of Peru company, which is 50% of GMP and 50% of Oil Tanking from where we operate five terminals. These terminals are owned by Petro Peru, the government company, from Peru, where in 2014, we were able to obtain this contract for 20 years. As a part of this contract, we have investments that are already compromised to almost $40 million in investments, non-refundable investment for $200 million. The terminal of the center that we operate in the Cayot terminal, and in the north, we operate the terminals of Thank you for your time, and up next, I'll open the mic for Alessandro Di Zapata, our Chief of Digital Transformation, so he can carry on with the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daddy. Now, carrying on with this, we'll talk about digital transformation in GMP. GMP is committed with making a transformation of the environment. That's why we've included it within this strategy, digital transformation as a main access to work on. Within this, we are working on three important points for our transformation or digital transformation people processes, and technology. Combine the three of them, we have, and we are designing a strategy that helps us to improve our environment and be more competitive. Within this, we'll be allowed to have innovation and the improvement of the value chain of the concepts that we've already heard from Daddy, upstream and downstream. What we want is to encourage our process of adaptation to be able to face any adversity or challenge that we might face. And, improve constantly facing any problem that we might have. Also, one of the big challenges is to improve our productivity through technology, putting processes in order and making people understand why we need to change and change our behavior to improve our processes. And in any other way, we also want to improve the trustability and traceability of all of our processes. And finally, the generation of the digital talent within our organization, because as we know, this point is really important and it's something that we'll be facing in the near future. That being said, people, process, and technology is the trifecta to have digital transformation and we'll be working on them in each and one of the projects that we have within GMP. Now I want to show you how it's distributed everything that we're working on and one of the main 
or some of the main initiatives that we are working on, we follow the graph that we have where we can see where are facing the whole production. We have the oil production, we have the gas plant, and we have everything that has to do with transportation and distribution. We wanted to place it here. Some of the initiatives that help us to improve the digital transformation scope within our organization. In the upper side, we can see the main or three of the main programs that we have to be able to launch this and encourage in every industry a program to extraction of oil, another one for gas plant, and another one for transportation and distribution. Let's look at the first one. The first one is about oil extraction. We have a program dedicated to having oil fields that are digital, remote operation, digital transformation on, on the whole environment of the oil generation. We've called it real-time production that we basically uh, saw a lot going on in this time of pandemic and we were able to operate with a great percentage of people from offices or from home, given that we have a lot of robotized parts of this operation. I'm going to detail onto it later on. We have optimization of the deployment that we have in our gas plant to be able to optimize this process of service. And we have also the optimization process of deployment when transporting and distributing and across the north of Peru. But not only we do that, we also concern about different horizontal things that can help us in our three lines of business. In the lower part, we've located and identified some of the important things that we are working and we are going to work. We have been working on having an only portal for people to understand and receive all of the information from our business and news or subscriptions that allow us to have contact basically with a SharePoint where we can have information of our processes with all the documentation that we need to back it up. We understand that it's important to have a, a bot that allows us to obtain information and respond 24 seven. At the same time, we have an industry that is never ending or never stopping. So that's why we want to implement a bot and artificial intelligence for it to be able to respond to any question and not just to depend on a human being. As we've already mentioned before, the transformation is based on the process of people and technology too, but we also focus in the culture, in the culture of acknowledge or GMP, understanding what is the focus or the focal point for people, what are the processes that we have and we transform them into an application that allows us to digitize all of this, enrich our collaborators in a way that we can continue promoting the culture of acknowledgement within our organization. And we have three more things that help us strongly towards this. We have RPEs that help us uh, into the horizontality throughout businesses. GMP yeah, allow us to control finances, management of people that are horizontal in the three businesses. And in the other hand, we have a strong campaign of going towards a cloud. Why? Because it's just that we are migrating as a sector to this type of work and that's going to help us to um, improve remote work. And the last point is system and data, which are really important in this industry. Data is a new gold that we all have in industries. It is a new asset of our organizations. We know that. We know that data are, is important. We've been working on them and we have a good foresight to be working with it in the future. We can work data to make decisions, we can manage data to predict or to have predictability, uh, and we can probably get ahead of some problems that we might encounter in the future. And that's why we want to use data in the three lines of businesses that we are talking about right now. Now I want to just explain the first part. I'm going to explain two of these initiatives that I consider are important. The first one that will work is the production in real time. Based on that, you can see this graph where we have production in the uh, left side and time in the lower side. We see how we see a production and then a little human that's controlling pits, for example. And then out of the medium or the line that we've calculated, or the average, basically we had a gap. 
and we are just highlighting it in red. There's a, a loss of production while somebody went over there and taking actions. What can we understand of it? We can observe that in this point, we had to wait till the, this person to get here to arrive to the location and there was a loss, but we didn't know about it yet. We found out when they got there, but there's also a time loss well, a while this individual is analyzing to make a decision, which is his whole part. But here, once you make a decision and then a time goes by to recover, and we have this ongoing lost loss process. So this goes hand in hand with what we were talking about in the organization transformation, a digital transformation for people, process, and the uh, whole space itself we have something that we can improve we need to improve this loss once we understand this we need to decide to improve the process to avoid this connection point that we have and to try to get ahead of it and decrease our loss and then as we understand and we improve our processes we can take it to a digital scope that will allow us to avoid or reduce as much as we can this type of losses this is one of the main points that we work around management of real time. Using technology, focusing in people and understanding the problematic itself, improving processes and then taking it to a digital field. What else do we have in the management of real time production? The automation of all of these pits or levels that we have. We have a pyramid of five levels where we can work and that we are working on each and one of these levels. There's more developed type of levels and there's levels that are in the process of development. So we move the first level and we will talk about operations of process. We understand the process and then we go to the next thing, to the next two levels, which are trying to electrify or generate energy within or inside of the pits that we have here. So we can uh, place sensors and PLCs and place bump offs and to be able to place controllers that would allow us to control this page, this ma these machines, and that would allow us to obtain that data. That data is what for it, to be able to process it and generate actions of being predictive or prescriptive. What does it mean? We analyze and based in the information that we see, we can make a decision. Also, it can be that the system warns us of a future behavior based in the historic information in the current behavior, predictability of data. That's where we have to aim to, to improve our performance in this industry. And if we rise above the levels, we have cameras that allow us to see all of this information and then also help us to obtain information from the biotech devices deployed across the field and, and also information on many other applications that allow us to make this type of decisions. All of this takes us to what we call our digital field, to try to digitize as much as we can our operations to become more efficient and to be able to face it and to face any situation in the future. Other point that I wanted to take you to and understand is the automation of our deployment processes. We've talked about the huge programs that we have in the oil side, and now I want us to go towards the other part, to transportation and distribution. Here, we have another big project that has to do with the automation of processes of delivery. Now, processes are the same, to automatize our plan, to be able to decrease and to be more efficient. And within this, what we want and we've already implemented is a flow, understanding how people are doing it and how do we respond to our clients and how can we take this to a process of digitization. And as you can see here, we've already said step by step, since you arrive, so somebody lands or somebody or a truck checks in, gets an inspection that we have the recognition for the truck and then they get to a door where they automatically read the plate, they look and check if it's registered, they basically raises the bar, the barrier, allows the truck to go to load to the uh, you know proper area, lay the truck out and they understand the load that they have, how much they need to load and then they send them to a dispatch island, explain about the dispatch details and then they go to the exit. 
to inspection, to a checkout, everything automatic. You read the plate, you we check that everything is under process and it's done. We all activate the barrier so the truck can just leave all under a system that's producing constantly the contact and avoiding contact between people and reducing the contagion risk in this COVID times. One of the main earnings that we can, could say in this last month is that. And additionally to that is that it's helping us to set a path to the digital transformation because we're operating the plant automatically and digitally. That will also allow us to do that by having it within the system. It allows us to have information that's direct and we reduce the risk of mistakes when filling out information or transcription stores the different uh, points or stages and we can understand here we have said that here that we have 20 percent of reduction in time for this process why what for because it's already automatized and the system is only controlling it and we are monitoring it with the cameras as we can see here and we generate actions from a control center this is one of the big projects that we are still working on we have not stopped and we have a basic outline of two, three years working time to basically to get to the dispatch time of this plant. This is something of what we want to share about GMP and all the transformation as an organization that we are undergoing to be able to achieve the change in the sector. So thank you very much and we'll see you soon. On behalf of Prom Peru, we want to thank the collaboration of the National Society of Mining, Oil and Energy and all the companies and speakers who participated in this round of presentations. Thank you.